Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Brenda Benham is sharing her wealth of, of presentation design and delivery experience with us. Brenda is a retired lawyer who worked in private practice and in-house at the British Columbia Securities Commission. Now Brenda trains speakers to give effective and memorable presentations. Her business is called Memorable Presenter Consulting. Uh, guests and VBN, welcome. Uh, please, if you have questions, type them into the chat. And uh, three times in the course of Brenda's presentation, uh, we'll stop. I'll pose your questions to Brenda, who will then uh, answer them. There is no need unless you really want to take uh, copious notes because the video recording of her talk will be made available to you tomorrow. Uh, I will give you a link both tonight and tomorrow uh, when the video has been published on YouTube as a public video. Brenda, are you ready to rock the stage? I sure am, Roger. Then the stage is all yours. Take it away. Thank you, Roger. I just want to acknowledge that I'm on the standing on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. So, how many of you have been to a presentation where the audio, where the presenter knew a tremendous amount and thought the best thing to do would be to dump it all on the audience? Roger, perhaps you could start the poll and uh, they can answer the question, have you seen a presentation like that? And if your answer is yes, then maybe you could also just put into the chat what you've seen or how you felt or whether you remembered anything or something like that. And Roger, when we get up to, we'll give it about 30 seconds and uh, let's see, we've got 28, oh wow. <laughs> I think it's a pretty conclusive poll. That looks Brenda. like a hundred percent or so, doesn't it? That's 125 out of 25 have answered that yes, they have encountered <laughs> such a presentation. Okay, I think we can probably stop the poll at this point and we don't need to share the results, I don't think, because it's 100%. So the next question for you, and you don't need to put this into the chat, is have you, I'm just gonna, whoops, I have this poll on my screen, so I'm just gonna stop it so I know what's going on, okay. So you don't have to put the next question into the chat, but have you done a presentation like that? I have. It was February of 1990. I was a, at that time, a very good transactional lawyer. What that meant is that I wrote stuff and I talked one-on-one -on -one to clients and I didn't think I'd ever have to present publicly at all. After I moved from private practice to the Securities Commission, I'd been there about a year or so, and my boss walked into my office and said, you wrote this policy, you need to go talk about it. And I thought, I don't really do that, but when your boss tells you you do it, you do. And so there I was at the foot of a raised classroom like that, looking up at a sea of securities industry professionals Maybe people like Carl were there finding out about this policy I had written. I, ha I was terrified. I was shaking. I, well, maybe I was hanging onto the podium, um, but I definitely didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I was there to talk about my policy. So that's what I did. Section one of my policy says, section two of the policy says, section 25.3 of the policy says, and while I droned on and on about my policy, what was my audience doing? That's right, they were sleeping. Those who, not absolutely everybody was sleeping, some of them were talking to each other about lunch, but nobody was paying any attention to me. I felt devastated. Even though I was a good transactional lawyer, I, was, I really thought that people might think I was sort of a fake, that I wasn't a real lawyer because Real lawyers can talk to people eloquently. That's what you see on TV. So thinking back to that first presentation I did, 
made me think about the work I did with Victoria Coven. Victoria is a designer, marketer, and illustrator, and she was giving a presentation last December. She was pretty nervous and she didn't really know how to organize her content. This was, she'd maybe done one other presentation before. She certainly wasn't experienced. And so she came to me and we worked together and I saw her presentation and it was really good. She shared really good relatable stories. She had a really good PowerPoint. She seemed very confident. And what she told me afterwards is that the organizational structure that I had given her had helped her have confidence to do her presentation and that organizational structure I'll be sharing with you. So how did I get over the fear and nerves that I felt? Well, I joined Toastmasters when a club started at my office. It was a few years later, and that helped immensely in getting over my fear and nerves because I spoke regularly and I got feedback. It was all great. And I became what I would call confident Brenda, and I gave presentations that are pretty common, at least for lawyers like me, for accountants, for engineers, and probably for other people. It goes something like this. The text, in my case, the slides just had text. For accountants, it would probably just have numbers. Uh, for engineers, it might just have diagrams. And I gave them lots and lots and lots and lots of facts, many, many facts. And then there was more text and facts and more text and facts. And as I got better, the text would come in as I spoke about the facts. And I thought that was pretty impressive. The problem is I knew I wasn't connecting with my audience. About, but I did presentations that looked just like this for probably 15 years. But about six years ago, everything changed. I learned how people learn and remember. And I learned a couple of very surprising things based on science. First, that facts do not persuade and that the more text and data you put on your slides, the less that people remember. So after this training, I helped my colleagues at the BC Securities Commission lawyers, accountants, engineers give presentations that were informative and memorable. And then in March of 2018, I retired from the BC Securities Commission. And later that year, I started my own business, Memorable Presenter Consulting. In my business, my clients tell me that they're worried that they're not getting and keeping their audience's attention and that they're not uh, they're not at all sure that their key information is being remembered by their audience. So you might be wondering why I started a business at this stage in my life. Well, I believe that everybody can be a memorable presenter, that every informative presentation can be memorable and engaging, and that what you need are the right tools. So today I'm going to share a number of tools as much as I can in the next 45 minutes or so. The tools will be in the areas of preparation, slides, and organization. Now, Roger, if you could post in the chat, there is a handout and there, Roger has the link and he'll put that in the chat. The handout is actually very helpful for you for two reasons. One, uh, it's a great aid memoir. If you fill it in and take it away, that's really, you'll be able to look back at it. Secondly, as a, as a gift or a prize for those of you who are here today and stay till the end, we will be playing a game at the end and filling in that handout, which can be done online or you can print it out either way. Um, that will really help you when you get to the game. So what I heard from you, you had a number of different issues. A couple of them that I noted were wanting to give too much information or the taking a 40 minute presentation and making it 20 minutes. Um, putting to getting people's attention was definitely one of the questions, things I heard and uh, putting it together or procrastinating and not doing it until the very last minute was another thing I heard. So why does all this matter? Well, 
first for any of you who are afraid of public speaking, and I didn't hear that very much, but there might be some of you who that's the case, that is the case, fear of public speaking has a big impact. Ethos3 published a study which estimated that fear of public speaking cuts wages by 10% and inhibits promotion to management by 15%. But it's not just fear that's a problem. Bad presentations have an impact on the speaker. It can harm your career and it can make you be seen as not being an expert in your field. And if you're speaking on behalf of a business, it can harm the reputation of the business and it can mean that the business loses or doesn't gain clients. I actually saw this in practice. It was June of 2017. It was a legal presentation from Toronto. There was a group of about 10 lawyers at the commission in a boardroom. The presenter gave a really, really horrible presentation. She did everything I'd tell you not to and more besides that. And at the end of the presentation, as they walked out, at least half of my colleagues, maybe three quarters said, I would never hire her. And that's too bad because she is an extremely good transactional lawyer like I was 30 years ago. The fact she gave a bad presentation doesn't mean she's not an expert in her field, she is. But that the way they saw her presentation affected how they saw her as a lawyer. And it applies not just to lawyers, of course. So now would be, if you've got the handout, now would be the time to fill in the blanks on the handout. I'll give you just a few seconds to do that. If you don't have it completely filled in, there will be other pauses to fill it in. So I'm going to move on now to preparation. And this in a way gets to Sarah's question about uh, procrastination. Yes, preparation is important. And the big mistake with preparation is not doing it. So lack of presentation is preparation is mistake number one. I have what I call three pre-steps. And they're pre-steps in the sense that these are things you should do before you start crafting your presentation, before you make notes of what, you know, exactly what, how you're going to structure it, before you start, if you do write it out, before you write it out, these are things you do first. The three pre-steps are audience focus, purpose, and equipment. So let's start with audience focus. Who is your audience that you're speaking to? What's their background? Are they all millennials? Are they all baby boomers? Quite different in how they approach information. How much do they know? Are they experts in your field so they'd know what you, you know, you're adding to their existing knowledge and you consume a basic level of understanding or are they the general public and they wouldn't really know what you're talking about without some background? And finally, what is their learning style? Do they learn best by seeing images? Do they learn best by writing it down? Do they learn best by doing it? Second step is purpose. And there are two, you have your overall purpose. So are you there to educate? Are you there to motivate and inspire? Are you there to make them laugh? Like what is your primary purpose? Pick one, you may have several of those, maybe the case, but pick one as your main overall purpose. And then of course, there is your specific purpose. What do you want them to think, feel, do at the end of your presentation? Then we come to equipment, that is things outside your, um, your presentation itself in a way. Uh, the first of these is props. So for example, are you going to wave a pen around? Is that something that would be useful? And the question for props isn't that you must have them, but rather, do they serve a purpose or do they simply distract? The second thing is videos. Again, first question is, do they serve a purpose? Will they move your presentation forward? And on when we're doing Zoom, can you do it in a way that is seamless and won't distract from, you know, back and forth between you and uh, your presentation and the video? 
And finally, slides, and I'm going to in just a moment or two get to my presentation on slides. Sli good slides enhance your presentation. Bad slides distract from you as a presenter. So this would be the time to take your handout, look at the preparation section, and fill in the blanks that are there. And while you're doing that, I will check with Roger if there are any questions about preparation. Question from Nazrin, is the method of making a presentation short, effective in resume writing too? So the question, as I understand it, is could you use what I'm going to share with you for presentations to write your resume? I am not an expert in resume writing. Um, I, there are certainly aspects of what I will share that will be useful in a resume, but this is really focused on a presentation. I have some friends who are experts in resume writing, and so if you're interested, you can put a note in the chat and I'll get back to you with their contact information. And that's the only question, Brenda. Okay. So in that case, we will move on to slides. Mistake number two is to overwhelm your audience with text or data. So what is the worst thing you've seen in a slide presentation you've been to? If you can put that into the chat, I'll come back to Roger in just a couple of minutes. The video that I'm going to suggest you watch tomorrow or the next day or some other time is by Don McMillan. Don McMillan is trained as an engineer at Stanford. He has a master's in electrical engineering. He is not practicing as an engineer. He is a corporate comedian. And his present, his video that uh, we'll share the link at the end of this presentation for you is called Life After Death by PowerPoint. And he shares in a very funny way all of a number of the very worst things you would see in, uh, in a slide presentation. So Roger, what have people said about bad things in PowerPoint or bad things in slides? Too much text, way too much text. <laughs> people just read what was already on the screen. Text too small, too cramped, too many personal photos. Graphics are not organized, repeating the same information too much. Detailed spreadsheet. Thank you, yes. Many of those are covered in Don's video and I'll talk about some of those as we proceed through slides. So as I said at the very beginning, the brain science around slides tell us that the more text and data you put on the screen, the less that people remember. Now, why is that? We know about this because we have a limited working memory and this comes to us from the work of John Sweller who came up with something called the cognitive load theory. So everything you take in, whether through your eyes or your ears or touch or taste, everything goes first into working memory. And that is a very confined space. And if it doesn't ever get into working memory, it will never possibly get into, it goes from there to long-term memory. It never goes directly into long-term memory. So I like to think of working memory like a wooden box like this for groceries. You take this box to the store and you're really, really hungry. And so you fill up that box to the very tippy top with a ton of junk food, pop and candy and chips, and it fills up and it's right at the very top. And then you remember that you're there for your week of groceries. And so, you go back and you try it, you get protein and fruits and vegetables and you put it on to, into your box, except there's no room in the box and it just rolls away. The junk food that's in your box is what John Sweller would call the how you present. And the good food you were trying to put in is the key information that you are sharing. So following Sweller's work, Richard Mayer came up with 12 principles of multimedia learning. Basically, most of the principles end up saying that talking and having an image is good. I'm going to share one of the 12 principles with you tonight. That principle is called the redundancy principle. And what that says is if 
what you are saying is what is on the screen, people will remember less than if you just spoke, preferably with an image, but even just speaking is better than saying what's on the screen. There's a couple of reasons for this. From a sort of brain science point of view, what happens when what's on the screen is the same as what's being said is that in the back, the brain is going in your subconscious, not you won't be thinking this, but in your back, it's going to be going, is it the same? Is it different? If it's different, why is it different? What's going on? The other problem is if you have three points on your slide and you're talking about point number one, your audience will be reading point number three and not listening to you. Now, I saw this in real life. It was a presentation on crowdfunding in January of 2016. The presentation was from Ontario, and the presenter actually talked about the different rules at that time that related to crowdfunding as a way of financing in Ontario and in BC. The problem was when he got to BC, he got it backwards. He said it only applied to group A, when in fact, group A couldn't use it at all, and only group B could use it. At the end of the thing, I said to my friends, colleagues, that was sort of odd. How come, you know, you don't see that very often? And all but one of them said, yeah, that was odd. And one of them said, no, no, he got it right. And we went back and forth a few times. No, no, he didn't. Yeah, yeah, he did. No, he didn't. And then he said, oh, I know what happened. I was reading his slides. I didn't hear a word he said. If you are presenting, you want your audience to hear what you're saying. That's why you're there. So as we said, you now know why it is that the more text and data you put on your slides, the less that people remember. And that means that there's a couple of common ways that slides are used that they should not be used. One is to use it as speaking notes. That is the one somebody said. They have every word on the slide and they are reading their slides. Worse yet, it's behind them and they're turning around from their audience and reading their slides. The second thing, and this is more common, is people use their slides as speaking notes. And that is also not what slides are for. Handouts, I'm sorry, the second one was handouts. Handouts are fine, I have a handout for you, but it's not up behind me on a screen. So if slides are not speaking notes, and they're not handouts, what are slides for? Slides are there to support you as a speaker, not to replace you. So I'm going to share three tools to transform your slides. The first is to include an image and title on every slide. Thinking back to learning styles, the image is for the visual learners, the title is for the reading writing learners. The second tool is to, in, is to include a maximum of three bullet points of one or two words per bullet point. You don't want full sentences, you don't want much text on your slides at all. And thirdly is what I call my 15 step test. So this goes to the size of the text and that is important whether you are presenting in person or online for different reasons. But this test is a nice little thing you can do. So take your slide that has the most text on it, have that up on your screen, turn around, walk back 15 steps, turn around and see if you can read it easily without squinting. If you can, great. If you can't, you need to increase the font size and you may well need to remove some of the text that's on the screen. So that brings us to the handout. If you can take your handout now, fill in the blanks for slides. And Roger, do we have any questions about slides? Yes. Uh, should I memorize my presentation? Ah, my short answer is no. That's almost more a preparation question than a slide question, but it's a good question. Um, no, you want to practice it until it's inside you and you can just talk. You certainly don't want to be reading it. You read to put your children to sleep, so you don't want to be reading. That will put your audience to sleep. But the problem with memorization is what my friend Danielle Benson would say is it puts you on like right, a track 
like rails. And if someone asks you a question you're not expecting, you sort of derail. You want to be in a path in the forest. So you want to know where you're going. No, you don't want to memorize it. How many slides should be used for online presentations? There isn't really, I know you may have read that there's a certain number of slides for a certain number of minutes. I don't agree with that. Um, it depends how you're using your slides and how long you're going to be on each slide. The one thing I would say for online versus in person is that you probably want a few more slides for online because if I'm in person, you see me, I'm probably walking around a bit more than I am now. I'm not just a little thumbnail. You actually have me in front of you and the slides behind me. You can stay on slides a bit longer there than you can online. Any other questions? I have uh, so much information to convey. How can I possibly get it down to just three things? That's going to be in our next one. That's in the organization, not here. So we'll get to that. I will get to that question. Okay. Okay. No more. No further questions. Okay. Let's move on to organization. So I said earlier. Oh, I didn't say actually. Mistake number three is overwhelming your audience with facts. That's what I did for many, 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 many years. So how many of you have done something that I sort of call a traditional? organization is very common in within businesses. It would go something like this. Here's the problem I've been asked to address. Here's some solutions I've considered. Here's my recommended solution. And here's my reasons for recommending that solution. That is fine when you get to facts, but you cannot just have facts in your presentation. So having that as your full presentation is not effective in persuading someone of something. So that brings us to the brain science. And as I said earlier, facts do not persuade. Why is that? This comes from the work of Stephen Denning in his book, The Secret Language of Leadership. And the studies I'm going to share, I'm taking from his book. The other part I'm going to share in brain science is that stories connect. And this comes from Kendra Hall, who's a professional storyteller. So let's start with facts do not persuade. The first study is the death penalty study. In this study, the researchers got an equal number of people who were strongly in favor of the death penalty as a deterrent, an equal number who were strongly opposed. And then they showed all of them a group of studies half of which said that the death penalty had a strong deterrent effect. The other half said it had no deterrent effect. And they asked them what they thought. And the people who were supportive of the death penalty as a deterrent were, said they were even more supportive because they were so pleased that the studies showed that it had a deterrent effect. Those who were opposed said they were even more opposed because they were so pleased the study showed it had no deterrent effect. Occasionally, they would recognize there were a few studies that went the other way, but they weren't very well done. That's, they sort of dismissed those studies. Everybody saw the same studies. What's going on? This is something called confirmation bias. It was noticed by the ancient Greeks, and Sir Francis Bacon wrote about it in Elizabethan times. It was proven by an English psychologist in the 1960s. What confirmation bias says is if you have a belief and somebody gives you facts that go against that belief, you are likely to not see or hear it. You just won't notice it at all. Or if you notice it, you'll be able to dismiss it quite easily. So why do we do that? So the next study is the 2004 presidential election study. This is the US presidential election between George W. Bush for the Republicans and John Kerry for the Democrats. And it was done sort of six months before the election. They got an equal number of strong Republicans and strong Democrats and hooked them up to functional magnetic resonance imaging machines or fMRIs. What those machines do is look, tell the researchers what part of the brain is active when. They then showed the participants self-contradictory statements by their candidate. By the Republic, for the Republicans, it was self-contradictory statements by George W. Bush. For the Democrats, it was self-contradictory statements by John Kerry. 
and then they looked at the fMRIs to see what was happening. What was happening is the reasoning part of the brain did not light up at all. What lit up were the emotional circuits. And when they said they had figured out how to make those self-contradictory statements actually support their preferred candidate, it was the pleasure part of the brain that lit up, massively reinforcing their original belief. So that brings us to stories. And what I'm going to share with you about stories comes from Kendra Hall, who's a professional storyteller. And she spoke at the 2017 International Toastmasters Convention here in Vancouver. And she shared a number of reasons. I'm going to share three of them with you why stories help you to connect with your audience. The first is that we make decisions based on emotions first and then look for reasons to support them. And Malcolm Gladwell has written an entire book on that called Blink. Secondly, when you're listening to a story, there's actually an effect on your brain. There's an increase in two hormones. There's an increase in cortisol, which is the focus hormone. So a little blip in cortisol means that your audience will focus on you, which is what you want as the presenter. The other thing that happens is oxytocin. And oxytocin is the trust and connection hormone. And you definitely want that if you are presenting to an audience and you want them to do what you're asking them to do. Finally, stories are uniquely memorable. And that's because stories, as we said in the first bullet point, tap into emotions. And when it taps into emotion, it's the whole brain that's remembering whatever is being said, not just, say, the visual area or the auditory area. It's the whole brain that is remembering the point that the story is tied to. So thinking about stories makes me think about my work with Maria Len. Maria Len came to me after she'd done 500 or more presentations. She was a very experienced speaker. The reason she came to me is she had new information she wanted to convey, stuff she hadn't spoken about before, and it was one of her larger audiences. It was about 1,600 people. I wasn't able to see Maria Len speak because she was talking at a conference in San Francisco, but she came back and told me that she had I, so I reviewed her talk. I gave some suggestions, one or two, to make it better. She came back and said that she had made the changes I suggested and that she felt that it may allowed her to get closer to her audience faster. So just to review brain science, you now have seen the re reason why facts do not persuade and why stories connect. So that brings me to my five step organization for an informative speech. You may wonder why I have steps. You may think of a presentation as, you know, you start out your beginning, your body, your conclusion as more of a linear process. The reason I have steps is that each step is building on each, the next, the one before it. And when you get to the fifth step, that's the pinnacle. That's when you're really connecting with your audience. You've been connecting all along, but that's sort of the pinnacle. And that's why I chose this five step organization. The first step is to get the audience's attention. And you do that. The tool here is to start with a challenging story. A challenging story is one that hits the heart, not the head. And there's a pain point involved. My story of my horrible presentation at SFU was definitely a challenging story. So I have two examples. The first is starting with facts. At the BC Securities Commission, I was a staff ambassador and we went out and talked to seniors about how to protect themselves from fraud and unsuitable investments. When we first went out, we started something like this. Hi, my name's Brenda Benham. I'm here from the BC Securities Commission. And the mission of the BC Securities Commission is to protect and promote the public interest by fostering a capital markets that is fair and warrants public confidence in a dynamic and competitive securities industry. And I'm here today to talk to you about fraud. 
the problem was by the time I got to fraud, my audience was asleep, was sleeping. They never heard my information that I had to share with them because they had completely tuned out long before I got to the word fraud. After the training that I mentioned earlier, we started with Fran's story. Fran was a widow. She'd received a small inheritance from her husband. She needed more than what the banks were paying at the time. And a friend introduced her to a financial whiz who could get her far more than the banks were paying. He had something called a high yield, low risk investment. And Fran did a bit of research, but couldn't quite figure it out. And she ended up giving him her money. He was a fraudster and simply took it. This is a true story. It happened in Kamloops from 1996 to 2001. The fraudster's name was Stephen Hughes and he got sanctioned by the BC Securities Commission. And I'm here to tell you how not to let yourself get caught by a fraudster like that. And everybody was wide awake when I got to the word fraud. So the results were very interesting. We went out six months later and asked how many of the five warning signs of fraud people could remember. When we started with the BCSC mission, when we started with facts, people would remember one, maybe two, or none at all. When we started with Fran's story, virtually everyone would remember three, and many would remember four, and even all five. It made a huge difference. So that brings us to step number two, which is stimulate their desire to know more. And this is the tool here is to use what Stephen Denning refers to as a springboard story. This is a minimalist story that has a positive tone. The next step is an agenda statement. Now you may have heard of the way of a way to structure your speech, which is say what you're going to say, say it, say what you said. And that's fine. Of course, you need an introduction and a body of conclusion where you wrap up that does not make it memorable and that is not how you start. You don't start with your agenda. But after you've done your two stories, then you do have an agenda statement that has time. One sentence, one sentence, it has time and a sort of an outline of the content in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to share with you information about preparation slides and organization one sentence. So that brings us to our step number four, which is reinforced with reason. This is by far the longest part of your presentation. This is where your facts come in. And you're, you're reinforcing you, what you've hopefully already communicated, a desire for change, something to do something different through the first two stories you told. This is reinforcing. People are inspired or are starting to think about maybe doing something differently from what's been said so far, but you need to reinforce it with reason. My tool for you here is to divide your content into three big buckets. If you have time, you obviously can subdivide those buckets into three or five or seven sub buckets. You can go under that, but your big three buckets need to be clear. And that's also how you can take a 40 minute presentation and collapse it down to a 30 minute presentation or a 20 minute presentation. Your three big buckets are the same, but you may reduce the amount you talk about in terms of your smaller underneath buckets. The reason for three, three is sort of magical. Three is completeness or wholeness. If you divide your content into four or more, it's a list and not many people can remember lists. So that brings us to my final, the fifth step, the pinnacle of your talk. This is your close and I have three tools for you here. The, the first is a game. And as I mentioned at the beginning, if you stay till the end and if you are here today, you can, we will play a game. Why do you want a game? A game is fun and fun is always good. And it doesn't have to be a game. It could be a poll like we did at the beginning, 
but something that's fun and reinforces learning. That's why you're doing it. The game we will play at the end today is Kahoot and is using a platform called Kahoot. And the reason that I can't do it for those of you watching online is that the game pin that people will need in order to play is only good for the time we're playing. Once it's gone, that pin is no longer effective. So it can't be done. It's, it's important to be here today because then you can get to play the game to reinforce learning. Tool number two is to have a question and answer period. You can have more than one like I did, but you certainly want to have a final one, but you don't want to end with that. What you want to end with is your call to action. Your call to action needs to be direct and specific. It needs to be of benefit to the audience. And ideally, it ties back to your opening statement. So now would be the time to fill in your handout on organization. Roger, do we have any remaining questions, whether on organization or other things? I have so much information important information to convey how can i possibly get it down to just three things i think this is the three buckets yes this would be the three buckets and it's not that you're if you have a lot of information it's really a matter of organizing it no matter what your information if you think about it it is possible to get it into three if you think it should be six then you'd have your top three and you might have you know three underneath and maybe three underneath that or five underneath that. Like you can have layers of buckets depending on how much time you have. If you have, you know, 10 minutes, you're really just saying those three things, maybe with a story, but you're not trying to get into detail. But thinking about how to organize your presentation is critically important. And there is science behind my three is sort of magical. So yeah, try to reach for three buckets if you possibly can. Any other questions? Uh, Nazrin is asking a question. What was the name of recent book? Does this ring a bell with you? I think probably the book, the book, I think the book that you're referring to or the book that I mentioned is called The Secret Language of Leadership. And it's by Stephen with a PH Denning, D-E-N-N-I-N-G. And if you stay till the very end and send me an email, I will send you the filled in handout with links to all of the science, including Stephen Denning's, the reference to Stephen Denning and the other ones that I've referred to will all be in that sort of completed handout that I'll send you if you send me an email saying handout, I'll send that to you. Question from Liz, can you elaborate on the difference between the hook bracket grabbing people's attention, close bracket, and the springboard story. Yes, yeah, so the, the first, the hook, the challenging is a challenging question. So it's negative. It definitely needs to um, hit the heart of the people you're talking to. Ideally, it's something, it needs to be relevant for them. So it needs to be something that they can really, if not remember, at least really, really relate to. That's what your hook is. That's the challenging story. And as I said, it should be negative or it needs a pain point because that's what people pay attention to. The springboard story is, is actually quite different. It's, um, it's a minimalist story in the sense that there isn't as much emotional content. There is some, but not as much. And there's always only one protagonist, only one sort of one thing happening. It's quite minimal and it is positive. And what you're trying to do with that story is encourage your audience to imagine themselves as the hero in that story. That's what you're trying to do with the springboard story. So that's the difference between those two stories. No further questions, thank you. So as I said, as I said at the beginning, I believe that everybody can be a memorable presenter and that every informative presentation can be memorable and engaging. And the way to do that is to have the right tools. So I've shared a ton of tools with you tonight. I do not expect you to remember all of them, but I hope you will remember these 
three tools for your next presentation. Tool number one is in your preparation to have a focus on your audience and think about them before you start putting your presentation together. Tool number two is to include an image and title on every slide. And tool number three is to start with a challenging story. If you do that, it will transform your presentation. Imagine if every time you speak, your audience is glued to your every word and they remember what you say weeks or even months after you speak and they apply your key information in their business or their life. There are several ways that I work with my clients to get them to that. I work with individuals who are inexperienced speakers, like I, I would have worked with me 30 years ago, or like my work with Victoria Coven. For those people, I give more detailed help in moving them along so their presentation can be much better. I also work with experienced speakers like Marie-Hélène Peltier. And for them, this can be a week before your presentation. And if that's you, then I would just give you one or maybe two things that you should change and tell you all the things you're already doing really well. I also work with organizations. And I worked with an organization called EWAS, which is a division of Cargill. And Katrina, who invited me to speak at EWAS, said she was really pleased that I was able to customize my presentation to the needs of her organization and in the course of doing that gave an engaging and memorable presentation. So I have a gift for all of you. It is a free 45 minute AMP up session. AMP in this case does not refer to electrical information the way that or electrical voltage or whatever the way that that thing is AMP is an assessment of the memorability of your presentation. If you are interested in signing up for a free AMP Up session, you can either send me an email and put AMP Up in the title, or you can book on my Calendly link, and the links are on the next slide. So the first link I promised you was a link to Don McMillan's very funny video, Life After Death by PowerPoint. Roger, if you can put these two links into the chat, the link for this and the link for the to book an AMP up session with me on Calendly. As Warren Buffett said to the graduating class of Columbia University in 2009, you can improve your value by 50% by improving your communication skills, public speaking. I'd like to thank Roger for inviting me to speak to you today. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out to hear my presentation. And now I'd like to turn it back to Roger. Thank you, Brenda. I'm trying to keep up with you. <laughs> okay, I think I've got all the uh, links in the chat for people uh, to take the next step. So Brenda, that was, um, uh, that was just wonderful. Uh, I, as you know, I'm a student of presentation and a student of story, and I think you've uh, uh, done yourself uh, proud, and you've given some massively valuable tips to our VBN members and the guests who've uh, shown up to experience your talk. So uh, on behalf of VBN, on behalf of our, our audience, thank you very, very much. You are most... Welcome. Now, I think you might be turning off the recording now for the external people, but we have a game for all of you who are here tonight.